Alrighty folks, and welcome to the Conlicker Podcast Channel. Episode 21, The True Hand Contention. In today's episode, I will be taking a head first dive into the messy, but really interesting history of the True Hand Contention. This period was only between 206 to 202 BC, but boy, there are a lot of events and stories that really need covered to do this period of time any justice whatsoever. And I'm hoping to squeeze all of it into one podcast episode. There will be a lot of characters here who I simply can't do justice just because I'm trying to get the history out and get the most important information out before I can really talk about any individuals. Now I know this doesn't do them justice, but I'm hoping in later podcasts or future podcast episodes I can jump in to talk about them. So in the podcast today, what I'm really going to focus on is just two main characters. The two main characters are Liu Bang and Xiang Yu. And this is a side note here. There is a show on Netflix called King's War, which is all about this period in Chinese history. I really recommend you go and check it out. The acting is good overall, and the show really shows you the characters and what they were like as well, and all out, it's just a pretty good show, which is pretty historically accurate. So, go and check it out. I will say, though, that the fight scenes are a bit meh, but if you don't really care about the fighting and you care more about the political intrigue, then go and check it out. Now, the first guy that I want to take a look at in this epic history is Liu Bang. Now, Liu Bang started off with nothing. He was a peasant and he had no money whatsoever. But to be fair to him, by all accounts, he sounded like quite a character. For example, he was always welcome at the bars in his hometown, which was Pei County, and his presence and his character always brought more people into the bar, giving it more business, which led to him getting free drinks most of the time. Now I do want to mention this here, it does seem like that he did sleep around as well, which is uh, again testament to his character, and his sweet talking is actually what got him his first wife. Now by all accounts, he managed to talk his way into a party of a wealthy aristocrats. The host, Mr. Lu, completely believed that Liu Bang was a rich man and a governor of a neighbouring county. He later managed to gain access to Mr. Liu's daughter, and before anybody could say what the hell is happening here, they were engaged and then they got married. To be fair, at the beginning of the relationship, they seemed to get on rather well. However, by the next episode, you'll hear about a completely gruesome story about what Empress Dowager Liu does. But of course, this is when she's an empress, it's not when she's a peasant like Liu Bang. But, to the rebellion itself, what made Liu Bang rebel? He actually started his rebellion by carrying out orders from the Qing government, coincidentally. He had orders to escort prisoners up to the wall where they would carry out their sentences. However, along the road he noticed that some of the prisoners had managed to escape. So he asked one of his men, what's the punishment for losing some of the labour force? To which his friend replied, death. Hmm, okay. He then asked, what's the punishment for being late? To which the reply was again, death. That's when Liu Bang decided, well, to hell with this, I just cut the prisoners loose and ran for the hills. Weirdly enough, most of the prisoners actually joined Liu Bang and this could only really be called a mutiny at this stage. However, as time went on, he would retake his hometown Pei County and then meet up with the larger rebel forces led by Xiang Yu. This would now be a good time to talk about Xiang Yu. So Xiang Yu was pretty much the opposite of Liu Bang. But when he did start was so, sorry. But when did he start to become famous? It actually started not so much with him, but with his uncle, Xiang Lian. Now Xiang Lian was a court noble in the Chu court. You know, before Qin Shi Huang conquered everything. And Xiang Lian was rather a wise man. He could see the writing on the wall and he knew Qin's time was up. It was pretty clear that when Qin Shi Huang died, all of the former states and the peoples within these states 
wanted to wash away the past 13 years of legalist doctrine with the blood of Qin royal family members and the soldiers they commanded. Now, early in the campaign, Xiang Lian proved to be a credible general and an able politician. For example, he managed to track down the legitimate heir to the Chu throne and stuck him back in the palace. And where was this young king hiding, you might have been asking? Well, he was going for the hiding in plain sight technique, herding sheep. But regardless, he was found and put back on his throne by the Xiang family and was named King Huai. But of course, inevitably, the Qing court does respond to this little rebellion and they send an army to deal with Xiang Lian. And basically, at one battle, Xiang Lian gets too cocky, thinking he could take on the Qin army outnumbered, but then he gets outwitted by the Qing general, Zhang Han, and ends up getting himself killed. Xiang Lian's death does leave control of what was left of the Chu army to the hands of Xiang Yu. It's here where supposedly Xiang Yu and Liu Bang meet each other and through his grief, Xiang Yu agrees to become sworn brothers with Liu Bang. But again, that's speculation. Nobody really knows if that is true. And it would be quite ironic if it was true. Just because these are the two men who would become bitter rivals in the future. So when comparing Liu Bang to Xiang Yu, you can see that the two men had totally different backgrounds. This is an important detail, as it shows when moving forward from here on out. So things began to settle down rebellion-wise, and there was just enough time for the Chu King to hold court with both Xiang Yu and Liu Bang present. However, the King made a shock announcement saying the first to reach Hanku Pass and then take the Qin capital, Xiang Yang, that man would become a king, an equal to the guy who just wrote this edict. What was even more amazing was that the king of Chu gave Liu Bang a huge advantage in this. Basically, he gave Liu Bang a more direct route, whereas Xiang Yu had to take the long way around, and not to mention fight a huge ar uh, army led by Zhang Han along the way. Smouldering with hatred of Liu Bang, Xiang Yu was just itching for a fight. He had to march north and cross the Yellow River, and he could see that morale was low amongst his men. After all, he was outnumbered by a huge margin, it was almost an extra 400,000 on the Qin side, and it was led by a very skilled commander, Zhang Han, the guy who actually killed Xiang Yu's uncle. So, after crossing the Yellow River, Xiang Yu decided to burn all the boats and said there would be no turning back for the rebel army. This tactic seemed to work and do the trick, because Xiang Yu, after that, won nine separate battles against Zhang Han's generals and almost destroyed the Qin army completely. This, of course, was the Battle of Julu, and it was Xiang Yu's most famous victory. However, Xiang Yu still had a problem. He still hadn't dealt with Zhang Han yet, who was a little farther to the north. However, Xiang Yu's top advisor, Fan Zong, knew how to make him surrender. It was rather simple. Send a diplomat to Zhang Han and explain his situation. The situation being that Zhao Gao, who was still in power by the way, was extremely jealous of other men's success. So even if Zhang Han won and crushed Xiang Yu's forces, Zhao Gao would find a way to kill him as he would be a threat to his tyrannical rule. On the other hand, if Zhang Han lost, then Zhao Gao would simply say he couldn't do his job and then have him executed. Win or lose, Zhang Han would lose his life either way. And with that, Zhang Han surrendered alongside the remains of his army, around 200,000 strong. Now normally, when an army this size surrenders to you, you should be jumping with joy. However, Xiang Yu wasn't. Xiang Yu was rather low on supplies and couldn't feed an extra 200,000 mouths all of a sudden. As well as that, he misted, mistrusted all things Qin, and in particular Zhang Han, who he seen as a threat. Therefore, he concluded that the only way to really mitigate any power and any damage Zhang Han could do to him, Xiang Yu decided to bury those 200,000 captives alive. 
The weird part in all of this is that he kept Zhang Han alive afterwards. Meanwhile, while Xiang Yu was committing war crimes, basically, Liu Bang was playing the nice guy, and every Qin city he went to, he would offer them a chance to surrender. If the city did so without a fight, not only would he spare everyone, but he would also give the city protectors the same job somewhere else. It doesn't mean to say that Liu Bang was all nice though. He did use a trick of bribing enemy generals to make their army surrender and then kill everyone. But for the most part, he was, less, he was a less cruel alternative to Xiang Yu. And of course, once one city surrenders and everyone is spared, the news spreads like wildfire to all of the other cities in Liu Bang's path. So everyone surrenders to him without a fight. And it is here that we get to the peak of the rivalry between Liu Bang and Xiang Yu in 206 BC. And this is of course when Liu Bang gets to Xiang Yan first and takes the capital and makes Qin's last emperor resign his post. But all credit to Liu Bang here, he didn't kill anyone when he got into the city and told his men to stand down and not to loot the place. He entered the palace once and then decided to leave it and camp outside the city. Now you'd be thinking, why on earth would he do that? But there was a good reason for it. Liu Bang knew that Xiang Yu was on the way and had a much larger army than him. Not to mention that it was bloody Xiang Yu leading the army. However, as Xiang Yu tried to get through Hanku Pass, he was met with opposition. The opposition was none other than Liu Bang's troops. So you can imagine Xiang Yu was absolutely livid when he heard about this and wanted to kill Liu Bang right there and then with his two bare hands. But that would be rather difficult, considering Liu Bang had the strategic advantage right now. So he thought of a different tactic. Or should I say, Fan Zong thought of a different tactic. Basically, the two were sworn brothers after all. So why not have a drink and mull this whole thing over? Liu Bang agreed to the request and it became pretty clear what this whole thing was about. Xiang Yu demanded that Liu Bang apologise and remove his army to allow Xiang Yu through to the city. Liu Bang, using his wits of course, then explained how he hadn't even stayed in the Imperial Palace because he was looking after the city for Xiang Yu. Now of course, nobody really believed this, but Liu Bang was backed up by his actions, so nobody could really question it. It's important to note that during the meeting, Fan Zong was rather twitchy, trying to give Xiang Yu some kind of signal. And what do you think this signal was? Well of course the signal was that a man who was planted there as a guard was actually an assassin who was supposed to be killing Liu Bang after Xiang Yu gave the signal. So of course, Fan Zong's like twitching saying, right, do it now, do it now, do it now. And Xiang Yu actually refused. Now Xiang Yu did have this impending sense of honour about him. And he believed that killing a man when he was a guest was such a dishonourable thing to do. So eventually Fan Zong, he goes in a bit of a huff and he storms out. And this is when one of Xiang Yu's relatives, Xiang Chuan, approaches him and asks what's wrong. So Fan Zong comes up with another idea. He says, right, okay, you go in there and you pretend to be a sword dancer because the party needs entertainment. But of course, when you're dancing around with the sword, make sure you lodge it in Liu Bang's throat. So of course, Xiang Chuan goes up and he says, here, I'll perform this sword dance for everyone. And everyone says, yeah, that's pretty cool. But then it gets pretty ugly pretty fast because obviously, Xuang Chuan is like trying to like swing the sword and it's getting oh, so close to Liu Bang's face and this is when one of Xiang Yu's other relatives jumps in and says oh well let me dance with you but then basically what he does is he acts like a shield between uh, Xuang Chuan and Liu Bang. So he's basically trying to get in the middle and not make everyone get killed in the middle of this meeting. And it is here that Liu Bang says, okay, this is this is freaking me out now. So then he says, uh, yeah, I've got a call of nature here. And then he leaves. 
But of course, he doesn't come back. He gets out of the, the tent, that, the, well, the military tent that they're in, finds a horse, gets on it, and gets the hell out of there. And to be honest, I really don't blame him. So, after the sword dance incident, Liu Bang basically tried to keep a very long distance between himself and Xiang Yu. But anyway, Xiang Yu was now a king because he managed to get to Xiang, uh, Xiang Yan without any opposition. And it's important to know here that when he does reach the Qin capital, he burns it to the ground. But uh, back to the political stuff. So when he gets there and he burns it to the ground, Xiang Yu needs to hand out fiefs to everyone who helped him get into that position. The problem, however, was, of course, Liu Bang. He did, after all, keep the capital waiting for Xiang Yu's entry, right? And he did help the rebel forces take out the Qin armies. So Fan Zong thought he came up with a rather clever ploy. He said to make Liu Bang the protector of Han and of course the states of Shu and Ba. Basically, what he deemed to be a wasteland to the west. Now this is modern day Sichuan province by the way. Back then there was this stereotype that it was a wilderness that couldn't support agriculture and the people there were semi-barbarians and all sorts of rumours. But that's the thing, it was all based on rumours and snobbery. The opposite was actually the truth. The Sichuan Basin has extremely fertile land even today and can support huge populations. As well as that, there is a huge mountain range that could act like a defensive lair so Liu Bang could sit there rather safe from any attacks led by Xiang Yu. On the other hand, Xiao He, one of Liu Bang's best advisors by the way, actually read Qin's tax records when they spent that short time in the palace and he took the records with him. When Liu Bang was sent back into this uh, wasteland, Xiao He showed him the records and they laughed with delight. Now why were they laughing with delight? It was because Xiao He had seen that the majority of Qin's grain actually came from this area. So now all of it was Liu Bang's. That would make you smile, right? Now it's also worth noting here that Liu Bang's most famous general, Han Xin, comes into the picture here. This is where Han Xin does this famous uh, trick where he basically destroys the one path leading through the mountain passes. And the reason why he does this is because there's only one path in there. So again, it's at, like acting like that defensive lair, like no army could follow Liu Bang as he goes to the mountains. And you'd be thinking, well, how does he get back? Well, the reason why he does this is because then he leads a diversion. He then says, okay, we're going to rebuild the path when we're ready. And he orders construction pretty much straight away as soon as everyone settles down. But what nobody knows is that Han Xin knows an alternative route. And it's a huge flanking maneuver all the way around the mountains. And then Han Xin launches an attack on vassals of Xiang Yu. But of course, that's getting later on. And again, like I said before, like the the different characters and things, Xiao He and Han Xin are two of the most famous characters from this time, and I'm really doing them an injustice here because I'm only just mentioning them in passing. The thing is, I really didn't want to try and mention them, but then I feel like I couldn't do that. I have to mention them. So yeah, just like those two names, you can Google them if you like. They are both very interesting characters. But anyway, back to the podcast. So after this settlement, everyone knew that there would be a war between Liu Bang and Xiang Yu. And it came pretty much as soon as Liu Bang was ready to strike. Now why didn't Xiang Yu strike west first and finish off Liu Bang? Well the reason was actually because Xiang Yu grabbed too much power for himself. And basically there were uprisings everywhere, particularly in the former state of Zhao. To which Xiang Yu had to go and put down. So whilst the Great General was distracted, it was the perfect time for Liu Bang to strike. And then this is of course the flanking manoeuvre that I mentioned that Han Xin performs, which was just military genius. Now the thing is that the two would fight it out and Xiang, Lu, Xiang Yu, whenever he led the army personally, he would win. Then Liu Bang would retreat back to his province and then he would come back again when he was ready. Now this happened like at least three times I think. 
And even on the second time, Xiang Yu had managed to capture Liu Bang's family. Not all of them, but he managed to catch, capture his wife, his father, and his eldest son. And luckily, Xiang Yu was the noble type and kept Liu Bang's family alive. Now, from here, there are a couple of stories that I do want to cover because they are pretty, much, pretty insane, to be honest. So the first is that after losing the second major battle with Xiang Yu, Liu Bang was on the run and he was in his chariot, but Xiang Yu's army was closing in on him. And the problem was that two of his children were there with him, and that is when he decided to try and kick them out of the chariot. What were they doing? Were they slowing him down? What, like, why? But luckily, the driver, Fan Kuai, another famous subordinate of Liu Bang, by the way, talked them out of it, and they managed to settle back in Liu Bang's old town, Pei County, before heading back to Han. Now, I did read a source that said Liu Bang was actually trying to get them captured, because he knew that if they were captured, Xiang Yu would actually treat them quite well. Uh, and then that way he could, like, live out in the wilderness with his men and then try and get back to Han. But regardless, that didn't happen, and he escaped with his children, and then they make it back to Han. The second story is that just before the final battle, well, we could say it's the final campaign between the two armies. So just before this, the two men are facing off at a cliff with their armies. On one side, you've got Liu Bang, and on the other side, you've got Xiang Yu. Now, Xiang Yu... He knows that his supplies are low, so he wants to try and bait Liu Bang out into fighting him. So the best thing that he can think of is that he patrols Liu Bang's father in front of his entire army and makes sure that Liu Bang can see it. Once he's done that, he then orders Liu Bang's father to step up onto this altar. And below this altar is a huge pot of boiling water. So you can guess what's going to happen next. Liu uh, Xiang Yu is basically threatening Liu Bang, if you don't come and talk to me now, or if you don't fight me now, then I'm going to boil your father alive. Now, of course, Liu Bang, you would be thinking that he's infuriated by this, that he wants revenge, or he wants to plead for his father's life, but what does he do? He actually just shouts across, send me a cup of the soup, and then he turns back and goes away. So, remember how I said Liu Bang was actually a good guy? <laughs> Maybe not to his family or on the personal side of things. Regardless, by not budging on this whole father being boiled alive thing, Xiang Yu simply couldn't burn the old man alive, as it was dishonourable. And maybe Liu Bang knew that, so he knew that he was bluffing. But, what's not dishonourable in Xiang Yu's eyes is pulling out a crossbow and trying to get a cheap shot on Liu Bang while he was exposed. Now, the crossbow supposedly actually hit Liu Bang in the chest, but he fooled Xiang Yu's entire army by saying it only hit him in the foot, which demoralized Xiang Yu's forces even further because he's supposed to be this great crossbowman, and he actually didn't hit his mark well. Now, after a while, the two managed to agree that the realm was supposed to be divided in half, and in exchange for that, Liu Bang would get his family back. And that was it. All living in peace and harmony, right? Right? <laughs> Wrong. Literally, as soon as Liu Bang got his family back, he turned on Xiang Yu and eventually the tide began to turn in Liu Bang's favour. The biggest reason for this was that the two men learned different left lessons with each battle. With every victory over his enemies, Xiang Yu became more cocky and more suspicious of his subordinates, whereas Liu Bang employed, and more importantly, listened to wise men such as Xiao, Xiao He and Han Xin. It all finally came to a head in 202 BC when Xiang Yu had either killed the majority of his loyal advisors or they had all deserted him, whilst Liu Bang had more and more men flock to his cause, and it all came to a head at the Battle of Gai Xia. It was here where the great Xiang Yu was finally defeated in battle, and it was indeed his last battle. The weird thing is that he almost escaped, but finally he was cornered, and along the way he heard that there was a reward for the man who killed him, so Xiang Yu apparently muttered a joke saying he will do the closest guy to him a favour and slit his own throat. 
Now, what happens after Xiang Yu commits suicide is that five of Liu Bang's men begin to hack him to pieces and bring a piece of Xiang Yu's body to Liu Bang, so then the reward has to get split five ways. But again, this is all rumours, nobody knows if that's actually true. And that was that. By 202 BC, Liu Bang had won and he had founded the Han Dynasty. Now there is actually so much more I could have covered in this episode, such as the battles and things, in terms of the tactics and that, but I was honestly trying my best to do this episode within 20 minutes, and I can already see that we're hitting the 25 minute mark. So I'm going to leave it here. Now I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and next week what we're going to be looking at is what Liu Bang does when he becomes Emperor of China. So I hope you can tune in for that, and I look forward to seeing you next time on the Chronicler Podcast channel. Thanks for listening.